The first scripture is from Isaiah 53, just one verse. Um, but this text from what's called Second Isaiah, talking about the suffering servant, is one that's often referred to as being one of the most specific prophecies of Jesus, especially him dying on the cross. Um, but th just one verse here. It says, he was despised and rejected by others, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity. And then from the Newer Testament, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were immersed into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Then Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into the one who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it's equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. And then finally, Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That ends the readings. Now, a number of people shared with me that they found last week's Earth Day service meaningful. I mean, uh, Araceli, I was glad to hear you say it kind of stayed with you all week. A number of people said that. Um, the whole focus on the problem of plastic um, was and is a bit overwhelming, but a number of people said, in essence, you know, I'm just glad to belong to a church that's trying to deal with reality and with truth and somehow respond with love and a commitment to showing up at this point in history and doing whatever we can to change things for the better. Those of you who were here might remember that I ended last week's message by talking about the need for us to get emotionally involved with creation and to love the earth and the material world so much that we would rise up and protect it like we would our family and that we'd weep over it if something happened to it. And that made me think of that commercial that I showed at the end of the worship service from when I was a kid uh, that ends with a Native American turning toward the camera and weeping over the degradation of creation. And many of you remembered the commercial, and most of you found it meaningful, as did I. But after church, Art and Lawrence both of whom are Native American men, uh, came to me and said, said we, we have something we want to talk to you about. And so we stepped back into the sanctuary, and they shared with me some of what that commercial had felt like to them and the role that it's played in their community. And they did so, so graciously and beautifully and respectfully. It, it meant the world to me, Art, what you guys said. So I said to them, um, hey, I think that's something that our whole church needs to hear. You know, would you be willing to? And I don't know. I mean, Lawrence was going to make it. But maybe he felt that thought I made it meant a different Sunday or something. But anyway, we'll we'll hear from Lawrence another time. But Art, would you say a few words about what you and and um, Lawrence said to me last week? And stand up if you will, okay, so the Zoom folks can see you. Yeah, my wedding, and my wedding and content, and you know, uh, thank you. Um, since I've been coming here. And living in McFarland and stuff, I feel very at home here. Thank to all of you for, for your loving tenderness and the words and stuff like that. And nowhere else in the world I feel that that this church brings that home to me, and that's that. Um, message 
what that spoke to me and Lawrence was that we as Native American people, we need to do something about that since it's still being shown. And it's not your fault for what you don't know. But that Native American person that played that was Italian. He was not Native American. And for many years, people have been, I mean, um, the um, movie people have been finding people to portray us, you know? And um, so I looked at that, me and Lawrence kind of looked at that as an opportunity to write that, to say, you know what, since that's still out there, we need to do something about that. We need to correct that. We need to make it right. So myself and Lawrence, I've contacted my real good friend, Bill Miller. And I told him, I said, I wanna recreate that vision and do it myself in a in a proper way. And maybe starting here in Wisconsin and uh, making people really feel welcome and feel about, you know, how we take care of Mother Earth, what the plastics and stuff like that. And so I want to say thank you, Pastor Brian, for letting us talk to you and speak to you that way and in a in a respectful and a in a good way, you know. And I really respect your words and what you say and you as a person and you as a, uh, a leader uh, of um, the Christian faith. Thank you. And Thanks so God. thank you all of you for being my friends and me and my wife. It means a lot to us. And um, uh, so thank you very much, one and all of you. We love you guys. Thank you so much, Art. Yeah. yeah. What what Lawrence might have also said was that he's, that commercial has been controversial in the Native American community all these years because of the appropriation. I mean that that they found a, an Italian to play a, a Native American first of all, but also he said you know the stereotype that the buckskin sort of the, the the buckskin outfit. He just said you know it, it plays into a stereotype that's not really helpful to us, and it's just complicated. You know, and and it was such a beautiful thing to to have that immediate response, and and to uh, you know I just appreciate it so much. All right, now after church ended though, and I got through Bible study and I went home and I was thinking about this. Um, to make a long story short, well, first of all, let me just say this: <laughs> you you guys both did exactly what the scriptures say this morning, to speak the truth in love. And I was so touched by it, because you, know, you could have just gone and not said anything and kind of resented it, and you know maybe they're not as, as uh, committed as, or awake as they like to think they are. I mean, you, know, you could have gone in that whole direction. And instead, you spoke up, you gave us a chance to get to the heart of this. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, right? Okay, so thank you. But I went home and for a few hours anyway, went into a good shame spiral. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, I should have known better. I should have vetted that commercial. I should have gone, you know, seen, done some, you know, hit Google and is there any controversy about this? And I was much more focused on the tear because it, it, it connected with my message than on the implications of that. I thought, yeah, that's good to have the Native American implication. That's great. But I wasn't thinking, you know, so... And then it bothered me, right? So, I, and all of a sudden I had a realization, ah, shame spiral. That's what it feels like. That's what it looks like. And that's part of what I wanna talk about today. But first, it's been a while since I've had a decent joke to share with you. And this past week, Farrell sent me a few jokes, which, where are you, Farrell? Yeah, which after, he's, he's I, I guarantee you, Farrell's very nervous right now. Yes. But which after cleaning one of them up substantially, I cleverly turned it into a joke, which I think is almost appropriate for church, right? So a man was traveling on a business trip, and he was at the airport. 
and he had a layover and decided to grab some lunch at a restaurant and it was crowded but there were some seats by the bar and so he went to sit and next to him was this extremely attractive woman and the man was single and he didn't notice a ring on her finger and so he just decided well I'm gonna at least say hello so he did, and to his surprise, she greeted him very, very warmly and seemed interested in talking, so they struck up a conversation, and, and uh, you know, he said, so where are you going? She said, well, actually, I'm on a conference to deliver a keynote address, and, and he said, oh, really, what, you know, what do you, what do you do? And she says, well, I'm a therapist, and he said, well, what kind? And she said, well, marriage and intimacy therapist, and I'm cleaning it up, right? And he said, well, that's, fa that, that's fantastic, you know? Um, so, you know, what's the focus of your address? And she said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing research and writing a book on the connection between ethnicity and marital intimacy. Cleaned it up again. And he said, well, fascinating. So, what, you know, what did you find out? And, and you know, I mean, which ethnic group is best when it comes to marital relations? And she said, well, actually, there's a clear uh, front runner, and that was the Native American community. Now, Art, I didn't make this up just to compensate for, you know, this, right? That's what the joke, that's the only part of the joke that still remains original, right? And, uh, and he said, wow, that's amazing. He said, well, who was second? And, and she said, um, well, interestingly, the Jewish community was second. And, and then so they're starting to have a conversation. And finally, she says, oh, by the way, my name's Cynthia. And she extends her hand. And, and he says, she says, what's your name? And he says, Hiawatha Goldberg. I know it's time for me to go on sabbatical. I was, uh, just get a little something to remember me by there, you know? You'll all be thinking, what did the pastor say today? Hiawatha Goldberg, that's all I got out of it. Yeah. In all seriousness, last Sunday afternoon, as I was reflecting on our conversation, I had to work myself out of a, a shame spiral. You didn't intend for me to feel that way, I know. But I beat myself up a little bit. I should have thought more about it, you know. And I started to should on myself. And you have heard me playfully refer to shoulding as the 11th commandment, thou shalt not should on thyself. In fact, it will serve all of us well if we all learn to catch ourselves when we use the word should toward ourselves, toward anybody else, because it's almost always on the way to shame. So even though I know better, though, it's hard not to do it. And I felt icky about it, and that's a deep spiritual theological term there, feel, feeling icky about it. But thank God I let it go. And you know how I let it go? What helped me? First of all, just realizing this is a shame spiral. We need to be able, learn how to catch it, name it in real time, rather than going for a ride with it. And just say, ah, there it is. Awareness is like 90%. And then to have a little bit of a sense of humor and also to realize that when we're going in the direction of shame, the ego is showing up to take us for a ride. That's what gets hooked. I, of all people, should know better. That's ego. I don't want them to think that I'm not as together on these issues as I'd like to appear. That's ego. And that's all of us. Am I about to get absolved? <laughs> Thank you.
Well, a kiss from a Native American man helps, you know? Thank you, Art. Thank you. But we're apart from that issue now. Romans 8, 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Maybe you come from a tradition where you heard that, you know, you're not going to go to hell. I hear it is you don't need to condemn yourself for being thoroughly human. No condemnation. Those are times when we just say, laugh at ourselves and say, you know what? There I go being me again. I did my best. It's time to let grace be amazing. You know, it's simple but powerful. Galatians 3, I love this. It says, clothe yourselves in Christ. Put on the unconditional love and grace of Christ and wear it like a lovely loose garment, like a prayer shawl. Wrap Christ around yourself. Don't condemn, condemn yourself if you mess up because you're going to. You're going to mess up sometimes. You're going to get something wrong. I guarantee it. And just as we shouldn't yell at a kid learning how to walk, don't beat yourself up when you fall. That's how you learn how to walk. You know, it hit me. We are actually here to get it wrong. I know that sounds a little strange. But that's how we humans do it. That's why we're here. This is the domain in which we get to forget who we are. And then, oh, realize it and come back home. The power is not in getting it wrong. The power is in the realization and the returning to who you are. And that's why, you know, Richard Rohr, my man, he says, we learn more by getting it wrong than by getting it right, so much so that it almost seems that's the way it is by design. In fact, it must be. We're here to get it wrong. That's how we learn. And then he always quotes Julian of Norwich, her famous saying, first comes the fall, then the recovery from the fall, and both are the grace of God. We don't have to accept ourselves because, you know, when we get it wrong and let ourselves off the hook. No, our grace-rooted attitude can be, I almost said should, can be, we get to do it wrong. It's okay. Last October, I was in Nashville leading a music conference for the Convergence Music Project. It's a digital progressive Christian worship music company that I helped found. And um, I was busy getting things going one day, and one of the artists for that day was a trans man. And a very talented, beautiful person. And I should read my notes or I'm going to get it wrong again, but he came up to me with, no, they came up to me and said, I, I need copies made of this. You know, and we were racing the clock and it was the last minute. And I'm like, so I grabbed the copies and the, the guy that was designated to do that kind of stuff at the conference was there. So I gave it to him and I said, hey, you know, run some copies for this, please, and give them to her. And I was like, ah. Because I know this person and I have heard the story that they went through to become him. And they told me their pronouns are they, them. So I just looked and I said, sorry. And, and they said, yeah, they, them pronouns, please. But no shame, no guilt. 
I was busy, had to do some things, and then a few minutes later, I started feeling icky. There's that theological term again. So I went over to them and I said, you know, sorry about that, but thank you for the way you handled that. And they said something I'll never forget. They said, Brian, I've been watching you, dude. I know who you are. You don't have to prove anything to me. We're all good. And I just smiled and said, thanks. And then this is what I didn't, I'll never forget. They said, and thanks for not making me have to work so hard to make you feel okay about yourself. That exhausts me. Beautiful. Just let grace be amazing. Well, as usual, I got lots more. Not going to get to it today either. But apart from me and my mess ups, how about you and yours? You know, one of the beautiful things about church is that the more active we are and the more important the things we commit ourselves to and get involved in the work, I mean, what we just experienced together to try to bring Cheeky and Jeffrey and their family here, a lot of people involved in that, but so many opportunities to bump up into each other and to uh, get it wrong with each other. And as I listen to my clergy friends, you know what I'm really grateful for is that if and when we bump into each other and need some grace and have to forgive each other and find it's difficult to work here and there together, um, which is very natural, but if and when we have problems, I'm glad they're about that. Stuff that matters. Rather than about this silly, nonsensical stuff. I mean, my church is split over what color to paint the bathroom. I mean, God help us. So I'm going to close uh, by sharing the lyrics of, of a song it's from my buddy, Marcus. Never shared this song with you. It has a, a swear word in, in, the, in the chorus, which we will creatively get around in a sec, but I've mentioned him many times for those who don't know him. He was a songwriter, lived here in, in McFarland. He was my best friend for, for 20 years. Um, just a beautiful dude. He died of brain cancer at age 50. But what a lot of people don't know is that Marcus suffered tremendously from a congenital arthritic condition. His, his grandfather was the first to have it is, that, that I know of. It, it, it emerges in your 20s, and all of a sudden, all of your connective tissue and your ligaments and everything start going crazy, inflamed, and, and just in gut-wrenching pain all the time. His grandfather could not take it, and they didn't have medical help the way we do now with extreme pain. His grandfather couldn't take it, and he took his own life when Marcus's father was 10, and Marcus's father found his dad. And Marcus said, you know, my dad also grew up with it, and uh, Marcus Sr., uh, just in so much pain, but he said, my dad, the greatest gift he gave me was that even though he was in misery all the time, he never took it out on anybody. He said, my grandfather, from what I heard, was a mean guy. My dad loved me. And he never took his pain out on anybody else. And he taught me how to love. Marcus was one of the most loving, creative people you, you could ever possibly want to meet. So th this is a song that, that he wrote. And what he realized is, you know, toward the end, he would say to things to me like, you know, we're really just here to become the people that our life's circumstances school us into becoming. For me, he said, I don't know why, but I, I got more than my share of pain. That's been my school. And toward the end, he said, you know, don't take me wrong, but I'm glad I'm going to graduate soon. 
So that's enough. I'm going to just share with you the lyrics of this, but we all get to work with our stuff. We get to, we get to work with our stuff. That's why, I mean, some people that know me well, when they come to me and they want to talk about something that's painful, you know, I, I, I'm trying not to smile because I, I, and I get this from Ram Dass, but because I know that something important is coming to the surface for you to deal with. It's the universe's vote of confidence in you that you're struggling with this or that issue finally, because now you can become aware of it and you can have it healed and you can work with it and grow through it. It's a good thing. It just doesn't feel good. So here's the chorus. It says, the soul you save. That's the name of the song, the soul you save. Well, okay, th this line. He says, in the grit and the, and the sorrow. Now, when we get to the, you're going to just go Shh, like that. Okay, let's try it. In the grit and the, and the sorrow. Okay, try it one more time. In the grit and the, and this. Okay, that's your part every time we get to that. All right. He wrote this toward the end of his life. He recorded it in my, my recording studio. Come on. Well, I just sat down to, to haunt you from our Lord's 2008, making friends while I'm pretending to negotiate my fate. It's easy to be human in the womb and in the grave, but in the grit and the, and the sorrow, you become the soul you save. The soul you save, the soul you save, life is easy in the womb and in the grave, but it isn't wise and it isn't brave in the grit and the, and the sorrow, you become the soul you save. My grandfather lived in all the pain I live in here today. But he never knew a moment's peace till he blew himself away. But I stand here on his broken shoulders, free and clear to rave, that in the grit and the, and the sorrow, we become the soul we save. My own father found his father as he lay there on the floor. He come in that room a 10-year-old, and he was a child no more. But he learned to love, and he taught me to. And that's the greatest gift he gave, that in the grit and the, and the sorrow, we become the soul we save. So I'm unpacking my own self now. Into the laundry, I will go but I can't unlock those stains from all those many years ago. So I'm sitting in this laundromat just naked as the day. And in the grit and the, and the sorrow, you become the soul you save. What a beautiful thing to let grace be amazing. To be able to mess up with each other, to hug each other and say, I see you, I know who you are, it's okay. And to look yourself in the mirror when you mess up and say, I see you, I know you, and I love you. So, you guys have a good month. I know you will. And I will too. And we will close by singing Amazing Grace. <laughs>